So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verse, we're going to go ahead and read verses 13 through 16 in the ESV version uh, of the Bible. Amen. We're still talking about the words of Jesus. I don't know how long I'll personally stay here, but I just feel like the Lord's been wanting me to focus on the words of Jesus for a period of time. And this is Jesus' words. After he preached the message of, the, well, this is all part of the Sermon on the Mountain. After he's talked about the Beatitudes, he moves into this. And if you'll remember, this is about a king, right? This, the whole Gospel of Matthew is focused on Jesus as king. And so he's talking to his citizens. And, and so he's, 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 he's preaching to the citizens who have a desire to one day enter into his kingdom. He hasn't even gone to the cross yet. He hasn't even gone to the cross yet. He hasn't died for the sins of the human race. So that means that the Holy Spirit can't come in yet and to live inside of people. And, and that's really where it starts, right? Whenever, now that he's gone to the cross, now that he's been buried, now that he's died for the sins of the human race, now that he's resurrected, amen, now that he's ascended to the Father and the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, now whenever a person hears the truth of the gospel and they say yes to Jesus, now the Holy Spirit moves into the heart and the kingdom of God is established in the heart, one heart at a time, one believer at a time, and he's building his kingdom of those that will would believe and then we haven't even gotten to that point but he's letting people know in advance this is what it's going to look like and this is what this is what the citizens of my kingdom are going to look like and listen i think that this is important for us to understand because this message is definitely folded around this concept about being salt and light that's what a title is salt and light simple title but <laughs> i went to the jail today and i preached to the inmates and you know when we're talking about our kingdom and we're talking about our kingdom versus his kingdom and we're talking about people that want to, we're, sometimes we're willing to hear the gospel and we're hoping that it's going to help us. You understand what I'm getting at? Now, don't, don't get me wrong now. People, people need help and Jesus helps people. Amen. That's what he does. But, but many times people will live their whole Christian life thinking that it's about him just helping them and their focal point on Christianity is what you're going to, what you're going to do for me, right? How are you going to fix me? How are you going to fix my situation? When in reality, God's plan and God's will is for Jesus to receive his glory and his honor because the word of God says that it pleased the father that in him, all fullness would dwell and it pleased the father that that through Jesus, God the Father would receive his glory. And anyway, while we're sitting there talking about these things, one of the inmates kind of like interjects this. He's like, well, I think that I'm going to be getting a divorce when I get out. And, you know, and he starts to explain the story. I'm not going to get into the, it kind of took over the thing. And you know, and, I, and, and he said, because I just don't think that God wants my son to have to have this kind of a life. And, and the more that the more that we and, and he wanted to know whether he could ever be married. again. See, so what I'm what I'm trying to get at is this, is that already in his mind, he's calculating. I'm sorry. He may not agree with that. You may not agree with that. But no, that's my discernment. He's already calculating on how he can better his life and better his own son's life. And in the end, I said, look, dude, you're the one reading the scripture. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but this is the thing. The question is, whose kingdom are you building? But do you believe that the arms, the Lord's arm is too short that he can't move in your situation? Are you willing to believe God or are you already establishing your own will for your own life? And that's what I'm trying to get at to you today, because see, when we're talking about salt and light, the Lord has a plan for your life and he has a plan for my life. And the plan for our lives is a is a process of death. It's an ongoing process where he's crucifying our flesh and our own mindsets and our own thoughts about what we think God ought to do in our lives because yeah. it's going to make our life better when the reality of it is like, no, I'm trying to get rid of you. Yeah. I'm trying to get rid of you that was born of Adam and born in sin and all your mindsets and all of your thoughts where you think that it's 
all about you. I'm trying to get you out of the way so that you can really see the beauty of my son. Because once you start to see what I've done for you, now you're going to get a revelation of the lover, the, the, the love of the father towards you. Yes, see, yes. When that, then you'll be able to see, no, he really did do this for me. Because he bankrupted heaven of Jesus. Jesus hung naked on the cross for Matt's sin. And how long did it take Matt to realize that? But the whole time, Matt's trying to work his own plan. The Lord's surely going to bless this. The Lord's surely going to bless that. He's going to bless my finances. He's going to bless this. He's going to bless that. And God's blessing just flows out of him. He's a blessing God. But, but this is the thing. Whose kingdom are we building? And so whenever we get into salt and light, I want you to think about that because he's saying that you're salt and light. If you are born again tonight, if you have truly given your heart to Jesus, the Lord needs something from you, my friend. Amen. We all, we, I can remember, and I've shared this story many times, whenever the Lord got a hold of me many years ago, back in 01, after my sister died tragically, and I was crying out to the Lord, and, and he said, I hear you. <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear all my children. I know what you need, son. But what about me? See, because God has needs. And what God's needs are is he needs a people that are willing. Now, does he need you? Does he need me? Not technically. But he's looking for a people that will yield to his will and allow themselves to be salt and light on the earth. Because God has a plan and his plan is to use you. Amen. And so he says right here in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Some translations say taste, some flavor, some savor. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but instead they put it on a stand so that it'll give light to all that are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus uses two metaphors. He talks about light and he talks about salt to describe the purposes of believers on the earth. And the characteristics of light they're, they're relatively easy for us to understand because it's very spiritual, light and darkness. And most of us understand the difference between darkness and light. Anybody that's been on the earth that's sitting in a church at least probably has at least some kind of a belief that there are forces of darkness, just like there's forces of light. He, he gives this commentary regarding light and, and he illuminates the meaning because he, because he explains that Really, and we understand it is what I'm trying to say, that there's darkness and that there's light. And we understand this concept. But in the salt, he just basically says that if it loses its flavor, it loses its earthly purpose. So he doesn't really explain to us a whole lot about what he's thinking when it comes to salt. And I don't really want to overdo this part of it, but what does, does salt actually even have a flavor? I like to ask questions. I like to think about things. Does salt really have a flavor? You know, in and of itself. Um, so, so what is the meaning of the word for taste or savor? And and I want you to. I'm just going to tell you that one of the this is this is the way you would spell this in the Greek. Okay, you ready? Because we're going to go somewhere with this. Moreno. If you were going to spell it in the Greek, this is the word for savor, flavor, taste. That's in the translation, saying that if salt loses its flavor, okay. And some of the words for this to use to be describe this word is foolish. And then there's another word, and I kind of want to just kind of break this down a little bit, insipid. Now, this is a word that we use in medicine. Okay, I'm a nurse practitioner too. So we use this word in medicine called insipidus. Now, I'm not trying to get you to memorize this word because it doesn't really matter. I'm just trying to give, you, give it to you. You ever heard of diabetes before? There's two types of diabetes. There's sugar diabetes and there's diabetes insipidus. Something happens in your brain where you don't, you don't secrete the right hormones and your body can't concentrate your urine. 
So you're peeing water, but all of the all the negative stuff that the waste is not leaving your body. It's called diabetes and sickness. What's a simple way to break that down? Is dilute. So when salt loses its savor, it becomes dilute. And when salt becomes dilute in the story of what Jesus is trying to speak, it's losing its earthly purpose. I was thinking about this whenever I was praying earlier, and I tried to use this as an example whenever we preached on Sunday, that if you can imagine, a, like, I don't even remember why I used the analogy, but the, where the Mississippi would flow into, if you could see it flowing into the clear waters of the Gulf, it didn't really happen that way, but if you could, you'd be able to see the mixing. Okay, but the further out the dirty water goes, the less obvious the dirty water is. And what I'm trying to say is, is that when Christians allow themselves to move further, further out into the world, the less obvious they become that they're different than the world. And so the less salty they become. So whenever people are saying on Facebook, stay salty, that ain't what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about being sassy. He's talking about being different. Amen. He's talking about living the salt life. Well, the salt life is being connected to Jesus and allowing Jesus to be formed in us. Amen. And for, for us to begin to look like him and for us to stop looking like our old selves. Yes, yes. That's an ongoing process, my friend. The Lord wants to kill you so he can resurrect Jesus on the inside of you. Amen. So that you can be light and salt to a lost and dying world. Amen. He also says in Mark chapter 9, verse 49 and 50, I think that this was interesting right here. He says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Everybody's going to be touched by fire in one way or another, my friend. Jesus said that hell is a place where the worm doesn't die, the fire isn't quenched, and that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Listen, the fire is going to touch everybody. And for Christians, there's a fire that wants to touch you today. The fire of the Holy Spirit wants to touch you in your life and wants to burn away the chaff. It wants to get rid of the, the fleshly part of you to purify you so that the pure grain that's going to be brought into the storehouse of heaven can be, can, can be what, what remains. Amen? Amen? So he says salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Then he says this, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now that's part of what I was preaching Sunday. It just so happens that it was in here when I was talking about brotherly love. Because if you go back and you read the chapter in the context, this is coming off the heels of Jesus again explaining to his disciples that he's about to go to the cross. And then suddenly the, the, the two of the disciples, is John and his brother James, uh, shooting from the hip, John and his brother James and the sons of Zebedee, and they're saying, um, they're saying, well, who's going to be able to sit at your right hand in your kingdom? Wait, hold on a second. Did you just ask that question? Because Jesus just said he's going to the cross. Jesus just said he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be taken into the hands of sinful men and he's going to be treated improperly. And you're worried about who's going to sit on his right hand. And if we're honest with one another, so oftentimes in our own life, we're so consumed and concerned about our own personal promotion and, and, and these things that are going on inside of our heart that we're not really looking like Jesus. Right. And, and, and then he goes on to say, he goes on to say, it says this, that they, that they come back to him, his disciples are like, there was a man casting out devils and he doesn't walk with us. We tried to tell him to stop, but he don't know. We're going to keep on casting out devils and he's using your name. And Jesus is like, why are you trying to stop him? If he's not against us, he's with us. I mean, that's jealousy on the parts of their disciples. You're not with us. You, you're, you don't walk with us. He's using the name of Jesus. The Lord knows how to deal with folk. But see, that's what happens many times is that these things are in the inside of us. And even as a pastor of a church or in churches, many times we believe, oh, that church down the road ain't doing it right. Or this church down the road over here ain't doing it right. I've dealt with that before. And, and we got to realize that this is not a delay. It may be true. They may not be doing it right. But I'm, guess what? I'm not here to judge another man's servant. Amen. He said, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Because he said, unless you come unto me as a little child, that means you got to be stripped of all your own independence. You got to be stripped of your own plans. You got to be stripped of everything when you come to me. That's what a child is. He's completely dependent upon his parents. 
And, and he said, unless you come to me as a little child. And so he's talking to us about humility. And that's part of being salty in the midst of a world that's full of pride. All kinds of pride. Don't hijack the word pride. It don't even it don't hijack the rainbow. Hi, trying to hijack the word pride. And, and that's the world that we're, that we're living in. And people are filled with selfishness. And jealousy, and the Lord wants to speak to his people tonight. He wants to speak to anybody that's willing to listen. He's not okay with that being in his people. He, he, wants, he wants you and I to recognize that, and he wants you and I to bring that to him and lay that at his feet. And to say, Lord, I don't want this in my heart. I want to serve you. And I'm not serving you just for what I can get out of you, but I'm serving you because you're worthy. You're worthy of glory and honor. That's true Christianity, my friend. And if you're hearing somebody else tell you something else that's all about elevating you and exalting you, you're hearing a wrong message because the gospel says that we must die. Amen. Yes, yes. He said everybody's going to be salted with fire. You know, first Peter talked about the fiery trial. He said, don't be surprised when you find yourself in a fiery trial. Then he also said in 1 Peter 1, he said, the trying of your faith being much more precious than gold. When you find fire being brought to your life, you need to understand God loves you and he's committed to you if you truly belong to him. Well, how do I know if I belong to him? Well, you need to be born again. Well, I think I, I prayed a prayer. Just saying a prayer don't mean you're born again. Well, then how do I know? You had to pray that prayer from your heart. You had to confess it with your mouth. And when you got born again, the Holy Spirit moved into your heart. Now your life ain't the same. Amen. Amen. He's changing you. Now, listen, you don't go 110 miles an hour from day one because, look, I'm, I'm 57 years old. And, Lord, y'all know I've seen the song. He's still working on me. But what I'm trying to say is, is that we should be changing we should be changing in the things that we used to do. We ought to not be okay with it anymore. Amen. The Holy Spirit is dealing with us. Amen. And he's working on our hearts <laughs> and in our lives. You know, the words about salt and fire, it's all talk about refining and enduring. Enduring the trials, going through the fiery trials, like not quitting and giving up. Amen. I got to tell you that I've, I've fallen short of the glory of God so many times as a believer. I realized it's a sad thing when I, I mean, I was like, I told y'all the other day, I was sharing my story with somebody a while back and I was like, Lord, I went back in the house and I repented. I was like, I'm going to turn and, and God's people always doing that to me, right? Has anybody, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you've read the Bible, you see where this is repeatedly happening. God's not just God's creation turned on them and Adam, but God's people, Israel and Christians. Right? And, and, and he still loves us. And he's so merciful and gracious. And he keeps coming after us. I'm so thankful. Amen. That he didn't. But, but salt and fire is to talk about refining and enduring. What remains will be purified. People who refuse the will of God will be salted by fire their own way. And the people of God will be salted by fire another way. So, so that what is Christ will remain. It will be preserved and it will endure until the end. He's forming Jesus in you. Amen. He's putting the fire to your faith. So don't give up. Don't quit when you find yourself in the midst of situations. You, listen, we've got to learn how to become mature in the faith. And one of the biggest one of the biggest things that we need to do is to understand the scriptures. It's not just about reading the Bible. It's about understanding what the scriptures are saying. It's talking about it talks about a renewed mind. You're not the old man that you used to be. You're a new man. And so now the word of God wants to re-enculturate you from your old way of thinking and your old way of life. Y'all hear me talk about that all the time. My mama's people, they play boo ray till 3 o'clock in the morning drinking scotch whiskey. My daddy's people like to get drunk and fight. And you, know, and, you, and you grow up and you learn all of these things. And then the music that you listen to, you know, whatever. ACDC, I'm on a highway to hell. I mean, I've been saved a long time. That's old stuff. And the word, music's even worse now. Half the time people in the church still listen to secular music. And they're feeding themselves with the words of Jay-Z and Beyonce. And all these other people that are serving the devil, a bunch of witches. And we know it and because ain't nobody dumb anymore. Everybody knows it, but you still, we still 
fill our spirit with that stuff. And we think that the Lord's okay with that. No, he's not okay with that. Because we're holding on to the vestiges of the world. And we're allowing the world to speak into us. And the Lord wants to crucify that old man. He's trying to get rid of that stuff. So why in the world are we holding on to it? Because you can't be salty. And you can't be purified. If you allow the world to continue to have its way in you. Yes, amen. Change us, Lord. Salt is talked about in the Old Testament. It says we don't have to turn to it. But in Leviticus chapter 2, it talked about salt being added to a grain offering. And in Ezekiel, it talked about salt being added to a whole burnt offering. And all of the offerings represent Jesus. And what salt is a reminder to God of is the enduring nature of salt. We're about to talk about it in a second. But salt is a preservative. Salt preserves things. And God's like saying, God's saying, my covenant with mankind is going to endure. There's even a salt covenant that he had with Aaron. And listen, I'm not trying to get deep into this. But until Jesus, see, there was another priesthood, amen, under the order of Melchizedek. We're not going to get into that right now. But as long as I need the Aaronic priesthood, I got a covenant with you. I got a covenant with, the, with David. My, my son, King David, is a type of the one that's going to come. I'll put salt on this covenant because this covenant is going to last. Because my son, the offspring of David, is going to rule and reign in the new Jerusalem from the throne of David because I'm an enduring God. I'm a preserving God and I got a plan for humanity and God wants to have a plan for your life my friend. He has a plan for your life and the question is will you endure? Will you endure and let the Lord have his way? Will you let him sprinkle you with salt? Will you let him put the fire to you? Or will you give up when you don't go your way? Will you get frustrated with God when he doesn't give you your way? Or can we trust him? Yes, yes. Man, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make myself vulnerable because I like to do that. When the Lord, Lord first called me in that barroom bathroom, I tell you all about that. I've been a Christian for 12 years. And I hadn't been in a barroom in 12 years and tragedy struck my life. And I ended up and the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that old stinky bathroom. And he said, listen to them. They need me. They all need me. Look at you. I can't even use you. You've always been willing to tell people about me, but only in a way where you can still look cool. No, you're going to lay your life down before me. And you will present my word for the way that it's written, and then I will use you. You know what immediately, Matt, is it okay if I'm being honest with you? I wish I, I'm embarrassed to say it, but I'm going to tell you. I thought, I, I, told, I even told John this a while back. I'm like, dude, I thought I was going to be preaching in front of thousands. <laughs> oh, man, look, the Lord finally got a hold of one that he can really use now. Hallelujah. We're about to, he's about to take me all over the place. You know, and, and through the process of time, you know what I've gotten to? I'm like, Lord, and I mean, this has been my prayer. And I don't know what the Lord has for, but I don't want nothing that the Lord don't want. I ain't trying to make nothing happen. I'm not trying to open no doors and kick down no doors. I only want God's will for my life. I am done trying to figure out what God's planning to do. And I know this. I'm going to preach the truth the way that it's written with the help of the Holy Spirit to give revelation to me. And if people don't like the way that it comes out, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm trying to say it. I didn't say it. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to stand before the Lord and I'm going to give an account for what you heard from this pulpit. And people that want to have tickly ears and hear something that they want to hear from another preacher a different way that it would come out. Praise God. If you can find another preacher that's telling you the truth and he's not being so, I don't know, sounding so angry about it, praise God. Go get it. But make sure it's the truth. Make sure it's the truth. He loves you, my friend. Amen. So he's enduring and the salt is a type of that and it shows us that he's, a pre he's preserving. Look at this in Genesis 18, 19. I love this scripture about Abraham. In the scripture about Abraham, Genesis 18, 19, I thought about this as I was through the years when the Lord, as I was raising my children, because, you know, even sometimes when you're raising your children, they're like, you know, they see the world around them and they see people in the church. I've been in this a long time. I've been to other churches, stayed in one church for 10 years, another church for 13 years. And I saw what was going on and I saw the change of the the landscape of the church change. And they're like, well, daddy, you're over here saying we shouldn't listen to this, but these people listen. I can't, I can't tell you what, the, I can't control these people. I'm telling you what I know what the Lord 
showing me. And, 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 and I think sometimes my own children resented me at times. Because like, man, you know, but, but look, what, look what God said to, to Abraham. I want you to get a hold of this. He said, I have chosen him. God said, I've chosen Abraham that he may command his children in his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Dude, this is so powerful. Now, I want you to understand something. If you if you're of the if you're of the mindset that you're focused only on the prosperity of God and the blessing of God, you're going to be like, that's right. The Lord promised Abraham blessings and prosperity. The Lord promised Abraham a land that would be all his. Can I tell you that Abraham never saw that land? That's right. Can I tell you that the promise that God gave to Abraham was directly related to the promise that he was going to give the world Jesus? Yes, yes. It's in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. It wasn't just about the nation of Israel right. and that it was going to be a whole bunch of people, but that through Israel he would give the world Jesus. Yes. And that's the promise that he gave to Abraham. And he's like, I'm looking for some people that will preserve my name. I'm looking for some people that will hold to the covenant of salt and would be preserved upon the earth because I'm looking for a people that will that will allow my glory to be placed in them so that my glory can be released from them so that they could be a light in the midst of darkness. Yes, yes, yes. God is looking for people that will partner with him and allow him to work in them. So that, I've got a couple of things I want to talk to you about salt real quick. Preservation. We've already covered some of that distinction and, de and defection. So under preservation during ancient times, I've already said it, but salt was used to cure and preserve meat. And one of the intended purposes of God's people, both Israel and the Old Testament, and also the church after the day of Pentecost is to preserve the name of God, to preserve his, his existence. Listen to me, church. We're living in the midst of a, of a crazy time. Some of you people are young and you don't realize it, but we're living in the midst of a crazy time. Time, the world is shifting, and, and, and the context of what's a man, what's a woman, gender identity, people, the world is full of a, a, a they're in an identity crisis because they don't know their father, they don't know what their name is, they don't have a relationship with God. And they're searching and they're seeking in the word. The, the, the spirit of Antichrist is lying to people. And they're looking for ways to make themselves happy and to be fulfilled. And the enemy is trying to create humanity in his own image after his own likeness. And we don't have time to get into that. And, but, but look, the world is shifting and we're watching it happen. And Christians are asleep. They're like, yeah, but that don't really have nothing to do with me. YOLO, baby, you do what you want to do. No, it's a problem. It's a problem and the world is shifting and the believers need to wake up and I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit slapping the pulpit and reminding people, we better wake up. Something is happening. We better make sure we're getting a hold of the Lord and that we're getting a hold of his heart and that we're letting him produce a change on the inside of us. Something is shifting, my friend. Now, I hope you can continue to live your American dream because ain't nobody wants to live in the midst of famine. But I'm here to tell you right now, you better learn how to hold on to Jesus and let Jesus be your dream. And, I, and you better learn how to become a citizen of the kingdom of God before and put that above your citizen as an American. Yes, yes. I believe that with all of my heart. They may not be popular preaching, but we're over here so concerned about our comfort. And look, sometimes it requires persecution. It requires persecution for God to have his way in the hearts of people. The yes. blood of the martyrs. Come on, somebody. The blood of the martyrs caused the gospel to go forward. That's what caused the gospel to go forward was the persecution of the saints after Stephen was stoned. And he said, I see the Lord and he's standing. And after Stephen was stoned, people went and they scattered and the gospel was preached. I wish that we wouldn't have to suffer persecution. I wish that we wouldn't have to be chastised by the Lord. I wish that we were a people that would yield and bend our knee to the Lord without having to experience 
experience those things. But the reality of it is, anybody in this house tonight that has lived for the Lord any for any length of time, you know better than I know, just as much as I know, that, it, that the Lord had to touch you in certain spots of your life to bring you to your knees. Yes, yes. I'm telling you the truth. Help us, Lord. That's his will for Israel. He said it in Deuteronomy chapter 4 about his children. He said, listen, you tell your children about my truths and you wear it like a bracelet on your wrist and you put it in a box in your head and you write it on the pillars of your house. And when you sit down in your house, you talk about it. You talk about me. Dude, I wish I would have taken that TV and thrown it in the garbage. The first time I heard Hannah Montana sass Billy Ray Cyrus, instead of stopping it and trying to give her a pep talk, I wish I would have taken that TV and thrown it in the garbage. I wish I would have done it in front of all of them. God's people ain't supposed to, they're supposed to honor their parents. Oh, that, that, I don't even know where that came from. I'm just trying to make a point that we're to train up our children. In the ways of the Lord. Then he said this. When I bring you into these other nations. When I bring you into these other nations. The word of God. They're going to say. What other nation is there that has a God like this? Because see the word of God. What other nation is there that's so close to their God. Because they have the word of God. He said, you're going to be a nation like no other nation. But if you and I don't have the word of God, if we're building our Christianity based off of YouTube preachers that aren't telling us the truth, and if we're basing our Christianity off of preachers that are telling us the things that we want to hear, and it's a bunch of fluff, and it's not preparing us for the reality that we need to die so that Christ can live through us. Lord, help us. How are we going to look any different than the nations around us? How will we stay salty if the truth is not being produced in us? Amen. Same for the church, the Holy Spirit of fire, man. When you get the Holy Ghost in your heart and in your life, my friend, let me tell you something. He's going to produce Jesus in you. He's going to lead you to Jesus. Amen. It also, salt also brings distinction. I've said this a few times, and this is just, I never saw a commentator say it, but I'm telling you, this is the nature, one of the natures of salt. When you put salt in the pot, it allows you to see the difference. Like, in other words, you, you put salt in a pot, now you can taste the garlic, you can taste the cumin, you can taste the cilantro, you can taste the onion. You don't have enough salt in there, it's hard to taste those other flavors. It makes a distinction. Listen to me. The saltiness of Christians makes a distinction upon the earth where people will realize that there is a difference between true believers because I think it's important that you hear what I'm trying to tell you. The devil's not scared of a counterfeit church. And the devil's not scared of a counterfeit preacher. As a matter of fact, the devil will build up a counterfeit church. I'm not trying to say that every big church is a counterfeit church. I'm trying to make a point. The devil is all about building up a false gospel, building up a false church. And I'm going to tell you something right now. We're in the midst of it. We're in the midst of it happening, and there's a line being drawn in the sand. You go on Facebook. I don't even have Facebook, but my wife tells me. You go on Facebook, and you will see that there's even Christians that believe that. that, that listen, I'm not picking on homosexuality. I love homosexuals. I love LGBTQ. You know why? Because they're, 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 they're souls. And I want, I want all souls to be saved. So it ain't got nothing to do with that. I love an LGBTQ as much as I love a person that's addicted to internet pornography like I used to be. I love LGBTQ as much as I love a fornicator. But the point is, is that the world is trying that, that, that Next year, I probably won't even be able to say this. I probably won't even be able to say this unless I'm ready to go to jail. Amen. Listen to me. In China, somebody sent me, I think it was Micah, sent me an Instagram video where this, where this guy said he'd gone to China. And, and the Chinese people said, would you pray for us that we could be like y'all? Would you please pray for us that we could be like y'all? Because y'all have access to all these Bibles and so much freedom. He said, I'll never pray that you would be like us. Never. He said, because he said, you rode on a, you rode on a train 13 hours to come to this meeting. And he said, and, and in America, if, if a preacher preaches more than 40 minutes, they get up and they walk out. Yes, yes. He said, most Americans have three Bibles in their house and they ain't opened it up in the last three weeks to a month. 
And here you don't even have a Bible and you're trying to memorize and share pages out of the Bible because you're so hungry for the truth. I'll never pray that you would be like us, but instead I'll pray that we would become like you. Hungry. hungry. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. What are you hungry for, my friend? What are you thirsty for? Are you thirsty for your own kingdom? Are you hungry for your, own, for your own will to be done? There's a distinction. Satan's plan for true believers. God, God uses the, the salt of the earth to make a distinction between what's real and what's false. Stay salty. Now you know what my definition of it is. Stay salty, my friend. God has a distinction. Satan's plan is extinction. Satan won. And I said it. He'll, he'll, he will endorse a false counterfeit church. And you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to destroy the church one lively stone at a time. He wants to get a hold of you first. I wish I had time to break down Peter where he said that the living stone gave life to lively stones and that you're all a lively stone. And that he's building a house that would hold and inhabit the praises of his people. A house known as the church. It's a metaphorical analogy. Talk about, about a building. But in reality the church isn't even a building. The church is a people. Yes. Full of fire. Full of salt. Amen. 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 Praise God. And, and, and the devil's trying to destroy the church one lively stone at a time. And the last thing I want to talk about is not really about, it's not really about salt. But the word defection is about this word right here. Moreno, it's where we get our word moron, foolish. See, God's creation has already offended him and now the church is joining in. It explains to us in Romans 1 and 23, and we've been talking about it. See, through the fall, fall God created man in his image and his likeness. And through the fall, mankind is now creating God in his own image and likeness. He's, he's allowing the, the image and likeness of God to be perverted. If it, Listen, preacher, if you're going to preach a God, a God that looks like that, that ain't the God I'm serving. I want a different God. Yes, yes. But the, but the issue is, is that, that we need to find out, is the preacher preaching the God of the Bible? And that's on you. <laughs> The apostle Paul preached to the, Thess to the Thessalonians and then he went to Berea and the scripture says that those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they went home and studied the scriptures for themselves. They didn't just take the words of a man. They went home and they listened. They, they listened to what the man had to say and then they went home and they studied it for themselves. Says in Romans 1.23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I'm running out of time. I just got through with salt. Got all this stuff about light to talk to you about. You're the light of the world, he said. He said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand. You're not supposed to hide your light. Now listen, you can't do it in your flesh. You need the Holy Spirit. Sister Lily preached a bang up message about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire. You need the help of the Holy Spirit to be a witness for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. But we're not supposed to hide our light. And nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand. And it gives light to all that are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and it would give glory to your Father in heaven. He uses two metaphors again. A city on a hill and a light in a house. It, that was rough traveling back in them days. You don't just hop in your car and drive on a blacktop highway. We think that the Louisiana highways are bad. No, listen, traveling from Nazareth to Jerusalem was rough. It was Mount, rocky mountains, caves and Things called wadis that were like little valleys coming off of the rocks and robbers hiding in the caves looking to mug people. That's the whole story of the Good Samaritan. The dude got mugged. They steal people's clothes back then. That's why he said, that's why Jesus said, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt. You get all of your clothes, you want to take care of them, you won't walk around with a bunch of moth meat. But anyway, the point is, is that it was rough traveling. And whenever it said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Listen, after you've been on a journey, you've been sweating and twisted your ankle a couple of times and you've been done walk, 
30, 40 miles like that, and now it's nighttime, and you know that there might be robbers out there. What a blessing to see a city on the hill. <laughs> it's like, man, because it tells you a couple of things. It tells you, number one, you're nearing your destination. Listen, believers, listen to me. If you're a true believer tonight, I got good news for you. You're nearing your destination. The, the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham was looking for a, a city. He was looking for a city, but he wasn't looking to move to Houston. He wasn't looking to upgrade and move to wherever the, the promotion was. No. And I'm not saying that you don't move if God promotes you. That's not what I'm saying. But you don't move just because of the promotion. It said that he, it said that he was searching for a city whose builder and maker was God. The old classic Pilgrim's Progress written by John Bunyan. Christian was the main character. And you know what he was looking for? The celestial city. Is that your destination tonight? Are you looking to make it to the celestial city? Are you looking to move to the city that's going to please you and do what's going to do good for you? And so, but most importantly, a city on a hill also tells you that you're headed in the right direction. Amen. You're headed in the right direction because you can see the light. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, a light's purpose is not to be obscured. Listen, there's people out there. It's not to be hidden. It's to be elevated. God is looking for salty people and people that are full of light that will let their light shine. Let your light shine. Amen. So that so that people will see your good works and it'll give glory to your father in heaven. I, I challenge you to go to the Lord to get in your prayer closet tonight, wherever your prayer closet is, and to cry out to him and say, Lord, I want to be a witness for you. I want to be a witness for you. And Lord, I need your help to be a witness for you. And, and that whenever the opportunity comes, that you would share your story with them. You have a story, do you not? Everybody in this place ought to have a story by now of what God's done for you. And, yeah, but I just got saved last week. Okay, but I guarantee you, if you got saved, you got a story. Amen. And I just want to encourage you, man. Let your light shine. Amen. Singers, musicians, I'm not going to keep everybody all night, but while y'all are coming up, like he talked about a lamp. He said, what, what a woman that had 10 coins and she lost one. What did she do? She, light, she lit a lamp. She swept until she found that one coin. Just so I tell you, this is out of Luke. There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He said, let your light shine before men. You know, Jesus is the light. The Bible says that Jesus was the light that came from heaven. John chapter 1. And then what he's explaining now in Matthew 5 is that you're the light of Listen to me, church. If you've gotten saved tonight, the scripture says you're the light of the world. Why? How did that happen? Because when you got saved, when you heard the gospel message and you said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit moved into you. The light of Jesus moved into you. And now you are the light of the world. You are the representation of God's kingdom upon the earth. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Scripture says in John 1 that as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. He sent his son so that we could be sons. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says all creation groans. Even the babies want to preach. Praise God. Babies need milk and adults at some point in time. We're supposed to move past milk and get to the meat. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> praise God. Let's give, give us meat, Lord. As they begin to praise and do this song of worship tonight, I want to encourage you just to hang out for a little longer if you can and just spend a little bit of time with the Lord and share your heart with Him. Amen. Just let Him know where you are in your heart. Whether you do it out loud, whether you come to the front, whether you stay in your chair, Wherever you are, whatever you do, I just want to encourage you. And, and I want to ask you to say a prayer to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be salt and I want to be light. I want to, I want to live for you. I want you to, I want you to have your way. Amen.